Slider Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Thanks for being here. Our latest special, Law and Order Police Under Attack. We are going to talk today to a former police officer. Just make sense of just this mess going on. Get a get a police officer's perspective on what happened in Atlanta and George Floyd and other things. Uh, we'll talk about warrants. Uh, I want to talk about bad police officers in our departments, how we get rid of them, and uh, just big picture. What's going on in our country? What does it What does it mean when it seems like so many people in our society, but it's not even true? Because you have so you have such a small minority who have such an outsized influence in our country, an outsized voice. And right now that voice is uh, police officers are the bad guys. So anyway, we'll talk about that coming up. Uh, we're going to talk to uh, someone about genuine police reform, Leo Terrell, uh, about what we can do there. And uh, a historian about uh, the history of, get some big perspective, some 30,000 feet on riots in America, uh, how riots change anything for the better or the worse how they've affected elections and, and, and that type of stuff. So that's all coming up today. As a quick intro, uh, on Wednesday's show, we talked to Wilford Riley. This guy's fantastic. He's the next Thomas Sowell, there's no doubt about it. And he wrote this on Twitter. This is uh, after the Atlanta police officers were charged with murder. He wrote this on Twitter. He said, I can't ethically endorse this because of how many people would suffer, but a one-day national <coughs> police strike would end this entire debate about defunding law enforcement officers forever. There's, there's some argument somewhere about how a people treat and respect their police officers is a sign of the health of the society itself. Right? There's, uh, there's, there's certainly a, a correlation there. And if that's true, then, then we're not in a good place right now. And that's why we're going to talk about Leo Terrell coming up about... Um, police reforms, and one of the reforms I want to talk about is this idea of an independent prosecutor. Now, the idea behind an independent prosecutor is to prosecute police misconduct m more fairly because the DA and the, and the police, they work together all the time. So there's going to be a conflict of interest there. So the idea is that the, that the DA is going to go soft on the police officers. So we need an independent prosecutor so that they'll go a little harder on the police officers. But in Atlanta, with the DA and the mayor, who are so motivated and, and manipulated by the mob, we have a DA going after a police officer, perhaps unjustly, too hard. So I'd argue we almost need an independent prosecutor to prevent over-prosecuting of police officers. You, we cannot live in a society where you have a suspect who's, who's driving drunk, who resists arrest, wrestles you and your partner to the ground, steals your taser and fires it at you, so he's proven like he's willing to do anything, and then you get prosecuted for murder? It's one thing, I'm thinking of these police officers, it's one thing for, for society to not respect you. I think officers can put up with that, right? They'll put up with that and do the right thing in the meantime. But no officer is going to risk their lives. No, no officer is going to risk being thrown under the bus by their boss and given a felony murder charge when their life's at danger. Give me a break. Even the George Floyd officers, one of them has been on the, had been on the job for four days. And they're going to argue, I was just following protocol. And you're going you're gonna to throw me in jail because I was doing exactly what you've all told me to do, all because the mob wants justice? No justice in that. So there's talk about police officers maybe going on strike. I love the mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms. She said something like the other day. She said, it's, it's my hope that officers will remember uh, the commitment they made when they held up their hands and, and swore in as police officers. Maybe you should do the same, Mayor. Noah Pollack, he made the point that right here we have a sloppy, rushed prosecution that's probably going to end in acquittal. After, of course, after millions of legal bills and reputations destroyed by the officers and all that. But then the headlines are going to say, oh, white cops beat the rap again, racist system, all that. It's going to lead to more protests and riots. He said it's so obvious and predictable, you wonder if it's intentional. Now, I don't know. Is it foolish or is it malice? Not sure. But the end result's the same. We have a media and a narrative right now that says cops are the bad guys. Fine, walk away. Walk away. It's the final fail-safe. We've been talking about it all week. You have three fail-safes that are in our society. We got God culture, family. Three fail-safe, they've all been removed. And what we've been saying is the last fail-safe, the police. You remove that final fail-safe, the police, 
And then everyone's going to see the real villains. And it's not going to be the police officers. Law and order. Police under attack. Talk with the police officer. Coming up next. Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Senator Crusaders, welcome back. Law and order, police under attack. What an honor. And, and there's no doubt in my mind that this man is, is placed here for a reason. Um, and, and has an incredibly important voice. Brandon Tatum, uh, his, his um, Twitter is the Officer Tatum. Brandon, how are you, brother? I'm doing well. Uh, former police officer, I should say. We gotta start off here, Brandon. What's your shirt say? It says, uh, false ideology created to cultivate victimhood. Yeah, white privilege, that's right. Very good, man. Where can people pick up that shirt? At the Officer Tatum store. The Officer Tatum yeah, store. Yeah, I can't. I can't wear that shirt, can I? <laughs> oh man, I, I'm telling you, man, thousands of people have bought this shirt and many of them are white. So, hey, if you bold enough, you can you can uh, put it on and, and rock it. <laughs> if you bold enough, <laughs> I just got called out. I got called out. All right, all right, I'll wear it. Uh, all right, Brandon, let's start off here first, brother. Uh, Atlanta, uh, police officer being charged with murder. What do you think? I think it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. The DA should be in prison for what he has done here, destroying the city, destroying the police department. I mean, he literally got on television and lied and said that Rashard Brooks was peaceful. And then just not too long ago, they prosecuted some officers for pointing a taser at some college students claiming that the taser was a deadly weapon. Now in the Georgia law, taser is a deadly weapon. It's also considered a firearm. So now when it comes to these police officers and Rashard Brooks, all of a sudden, it's not that big of a deal to point a taser at a police officer. So this guy is a complete hack. I know he's running for re-election, but this man should go to prison for his lies, his deception, and for him even thinking about charging these police officers. Yeah, all right, so let me do the devil's advocate, and then I wanna talk big picture about what this does to morale. But uh, I've heard the argument, well, the guy already fired the taser twice and the officer should have known that it was no longer a deadly weapon. Well, here's the problem. Even the DA said that Rashard Brooks fought, turned and fired the taser and the prongs were just deployed and they went over the top of the officer's head. So clearly it wasn't fired enough to not have prongs in it. If any one of those prongs would have hit the officer in the eye, would have hit him um, square in his body, it would have locked him up rendered him incapable of defending himself. It is a deadly force situation. And I don't know why people are confused, maybe because they want to support black people, maybe because they're racist. I don't know what it is, but I know that the police officer did what they were supposed to do according to Georgia law, and there's no reason they should be charged at this point. All right, last devil's advocate. Uh, this guy was shot in the back running away. Is that a, good, is that a reason enough to, to fire a gun? Yeah, it's completely reasonable. The police officers acting in good faith. All of these things are happening uh, simultaneously in split seconds. And just because as the police officer turns to pull the trigger, the guy turns his back to the police officer at that instance, that's not uh, somehow not justified. He was justified in using deadly force. Uh, Rashard Brooks was presented as a deadly threat, not only to the police officers, but he's a threat to the public. I mean, what was he gonna do next? This was supposed to be just a DUI. Now he's fighting police officers and running. Is he gonna commandeer a vehicle? Is he gonna continue to attack police officers? All of those things are present threats that police officers have to address and they address them according to the law. When the DA and the mayor throw these officers under the bus like this, what does that do for morale for the rest of the Atlanta Police Department? Well, it destroys morale. Um, I heard, and I think some of this was confirmed, that majority of the precincts in Atlanta, Georgia, the local police department, they walked off the job. Many people have called in sick, which was verified by uh, the Atlanta Police Department's uh, spokesperson. So you're going to get what we consider the blue flu. That means that police officers are going to all call in sick at the same time, and you're not going to have police officers on the streets. I heard that there was over 500 calls holding for service in Atlanta Police Department's jurisdiction. When I was a police officer, even though we were short staffed, we still had everybody we could on deck and, and 30 calls for service holding at one time was asinine. It was, it was it, it, like the world was coming to an end. You talk about 500 calls holding for service and I'm sure many of them are violent crimes. So it, it, it kills morale 
And it's, it's really, what is really hurting, it's gonna hurt the city. It's gonna hurt the people who need the police officers the most. Most of those individuals are inner cities where there's a tremendous amount of violence. So, so in your experience, I mean, we have this, this narrative going on by, I think, a very small minority of abolish the police and all this nonsense. But I would argue a vast, vast majority of people, even in the inner city, want the police, are so grateful for the police. Was that your experience? It was Tucson, right, that used to work? Tucson Police Department. Yeah, it was my yeah, was it that was that your experience, experience as well? Yeah, it's my experience that people that are in these situations, minorities, people who are living in poverty, who are, uh, for some reason uh, or another, they're uneducated, they don't have opportunities, they need the police officers the most. The biggest way to tell, you don't have to believe me, you don't have to believe police officers. Look at how many calls for service that they that they uh, calculate on a day-to-day -day basis. In Atlanta, Georgia, they, they're missing 500 calls of service in one night. I mean, in Tucson, we were a police department of about a thousand uh, officers. We patrolled a little bit less than a million people. We had 1,200 calls for service a day, a day. And this is not affluent people. Yeah. These are not rich people. These are people that are that are struggling in some of our, our poorest areas in the inner city where violence is running rampant. And so you cannot tell me that these individuals don't need the police, especially when people are getting shot and killed. They need the police department. You, uh, when you respond to a call that maybe, you know, you think might be dangerous or you pull anyone over, take us into the mind of a police officer, what they're thinking about, what they're, I don't want to say worry, but what they're concerned about, what are the threats that are out there that, that a civilian like me would, would not normally understand? Well, first and foremost, the person's race, none of that matters. Gender, none of it matters. What you're worried about and what you're concerned about is practicing your tactics and being consistent in case it goes south. And you are prepared and mentally prepared that every time you pull somebody over, this could be the end. This could be the end. You may have to go to a deadly force situation. So you follow your training. You go up. You methodically make sure that it's safe. You contact the person in the driver's seat. If the person is peaceful, you are relieved. That don't mean you let your guard down, but you're relieved. You can at least communicate with them like normal people. Now, if the person get hostile, now and raise it to a to a different level. Now you're in fear to say, okay, is this person have this person killed somebody and we don't know about it? Has this person is this person drunk? Is this person a, a, a convicted felon? What is this person uh, so amped up about when they were just getting pulled over for a speeding ticket? And so it gives you a heightened awareness. Sometimes it's fearful. You don't know when you know you could lose your life over a traffic stop. Yeah. What's something that when you pull someone over, something that someone says or does where, that heightens your awareness? You're like, uh-oh. Like, it could be something subtle though, right? But what is it that makes you your radar go up? Well, one of the things is when somebody come off right at the bat and say, you pull me over because I'm black. That's not yeah, a okay. necessarily a threat of physical bodily injury, but you start to wonder, okay, what is what path is this person going down? Why are they upset? Why are they projecting racism on me? when they were wrong and they knew they were wrong. And there's there's yeah. other things where you ask a person for identification. You say, hey, do you have your driver's license and insurance? If a person says, well, I, 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 don't, I don't have one, or I don't have it with me, that's, to me, based on my training experience, that's the first sign. Most people carry their identification. A lot of people who don't have their identification at the time of the traffic stop, they are driving on a suspended driver's license. So I'm not saying that's 100% of the, of the case, but some yeah. of those indications can lead you down a path to say, okay, there's probably something else going on here. Man, no one understands that. No one understands what it's like for a police officer to pull someone over and go up to a car and you have no idea what's going on inside that and what's gonna happen next. People, mo most people can handle it, but we don't even think about it. And you guys live it every day. Uh, let's talk about bad cops, uh, Brandon. What percentage in your experience uh, should not be police officers? I think it could be about 3% of the police department okay. probably shouldn't be police officers. And what I will say is out of the 3%, there's probably less than a percentage point of people who are dangerous, people who are killed individuals, people who are committing crimes. The other portion of the 3% that I spoke about are officers who just don't operate like police officers should. They got terrible attitudes. They're always getting into fights and altercations, even though it's legally, they stimulate uh, drama and activity. They're not competent and all of the above that they put other officers' lives in danger. So I say it's about 3% of officers that are that I believe that should be removed from the police department or they should be doing another job. Um, as far as the majority of the police department, they're good quality people. The average police officer is a better person than the average person walking on the street. You have to be at a different mm -hmm. level 
in order for you to pass the, the background check, in order for you to pass the academy, in order for you to pass field training, which I was a field training officer, in order for you to pass all this, you have to be an excellent individual as a person. Have you, there was a, let me ask this about the screening process. Let's go a little deeper into that, actually. I, there, there's this idea out there that there's not a high enough screening, not, not a high enough bar. You, they, they don't call for the excellent people. Maybe they call for, or, or the, the, the job attracts people who were bullied when they were kids, and now they want a badge so that they can bully people back. Give us an idea of how high the screening currently is, and could it be higher and better? Yeah, I think that I can't speak for every police department in the country, but I think the Tucson Police Department was probably the average uh, of all police departments um, in the United States of America. You got to be a fool to think that the average person can just walk into the police department. First of all, you have to have a pretty clean uh, criminal record. You can't have any outstanding crimes. You can't have any violent crimes and you can't have even smoked marijuana or any illegal drugs within two to six years. So you have to be a pretty clean individual to start with. You take a test that you cannot study for and you have to pass a PT test just to be able to apply. So once you apply for the police department, I had to fill out a 40 page background investigation where I had everybody in my family listed, people who were my neighbors for the last, I don't know, 10 years listed on there. And they had to be able to call each individual. They assigned a detective on the police department to do the background investigation into who you are. If you pass the uh, background portion, the application portion, you have to go through a uh, uh, oral board evaluation where you stand before police officers and potentially the chief to do a physical interview. You have to then go to the police academy. The police academy is six months in the state of Texas. It was 17 weeks in uh, Tucson, Arizona. You have to go through that and pass it with flying colors. You have to make a 90 or above on your test that we took 16 out of the 17 weeks. After you pass that, you have to pass it with flying colors and then you go to field training. Field training is 22 weeks. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot that you have to go to post basic training, which is eight weeks. Then you go to field training, 22 weeks, where you sit in a patrol car, you evaluate it through four phases, you evaluate it by a police officer, you have to take tests every phase, and you have to make a 90 or above on all your tests or you're done for. And each evaluation talks about how you deal with the public, how you de-escalate situations. Are you an officer that's equipped and you evaluated by other officers? That's not even it. You're still on probationary period for a year and a half. If you make any mistake while you're on probationary period, the police department can fire you with no explanation. And, 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 and you're still not over because you have more to do. And if you make any mistake, even if you're uh, missing your judgment by a small margin, you get written up, you can get fired, you can get disciplined, and you can get sent to prison, as we can tell, uh, with the recent situations that are going on. Okay. I had no idea of any of that. <laughs> I had no idea any of that. I'm super grateful you ran through that. Amazing. <laughs> and that's a quick, uh, that's a Reader's Digest version of it. It's a yeah, lot totally. more to it. So, all right, I saw a video after uh, what happened in Minneapolis, and there was a police officer in his car, a uh, black guy, and he said, uh, hey, man, this is why I joined the police department, to make sure that no injustice ever happens on my watch. And I, and I wish that we saw, I wish instead of hating on police officers, I wish we saw, like, recruitment drives in our inner cities to get more good people through the process to make have more good cops and, and weed out the bad. But I say all that, have you ever seen an injustice on the job that you put a stop to? I've never seen uh, an injustice while I was a police officer. I've seen people become rude. I've seen people uh, lose their temper, which is not an injustice. But I've seen both of those things happen. I've critiqued and criticized officers that done it. And I physically seen one of our SWAT operators, because I was on the SWAT team as well, one of our SWAT operators, which was a senior officer, an officer was getting amped up on the scene. He grabbed him by the vest, pulled him to the side, and ripped him a new one in front of everybody. And I think that was the appropriate measure. So in our police department, you're not gonna get away with acting a fool. You're not gonna get away with damaging the reputation of the Tucson Police Department. So um, I've seen people get amped up, lose composure. None of that is illegal. None of that is considered an injustice. I've never experienced a racist police officer. I've never saw racist bias while I was on the police department of a thousand officers and majority of them were white and Hispanic. Why do you think black police officers, I've seen videos of black people calling all the names in the book to black police officers, traitor, all the rest? Because these people are cowards, right? They don't have enough courage to actually put on a badge and risk their lives for their own communities. 
So in majority of these cases, there's a lot of white people that are brave enough to protect the black community and a lot of black people aren't. But the black people who are on department like myself and other brave African-American men is that we have a call from God to serve. We understand our level of service and we enact that. And in many cases, there are black police officers that say, you know what, I grew up in this neighborhood. I know the people. I know what needs to be to be changed. I have a connection here. I'm going to go and I'm going to put my life on the line every day for these same individuals that I grew up around, that I lived around. And that's honorable. But for all these people talking about black police officers, how about you fill out an application? How about you put your life on the line? Other than selling drugs and acting a fool and being an SJW, put your money where your mouth at. B. Tatum did it. All these other black cops are doing it. (laughs) So do not criticize black police officers unless you're ready to go there. 30 seconds. Uh, Stitch, snitches get stitches. How how damaging is that uh, philosophy to uh, communities? It's paralyzing to a community. If you look at Chicago, Illinois, they their murder rates and, and their murder convictions and arrests are 80% unlikely to happen. So, you know, a lot of people are committing crimes against people in the inner city, majority black people. And the stigma is if you don't, you don't snitch in the hood. So when you don't snitch, people don't go to jail. When you don't snitch, the drug dealer is prolific in your community, killing your kids. If you don't snitch, the person who did the drive-by and shot a five-year-old in the head is going to do a drive-by and shoot somebody's mama the next day. So don't snitch is a polarizing and it is a, a damning thing to the black community. And it's majority of the black community. I understand why, because there needs to be a heightened protection for people that that uh, uh, tell on other individuals because there's a fear of getting killed. But other than that, step up, be brave, be bold, and tell on these people so we can clean up our communities, build the economic success, and not have conflict with the police that results in young black men getting killed. That's it, brother. The Officer Tatum, T-A-T-U-M, The Officer Tatum on Twitter, man. Super grateful for your voice, and it's the, it's the Officer Tatum store as well. Uh, OfficerTatumStore.com, you can buy that shirt. And don't, I'm not going to be a coward, Brandon. I'm going to buy that shirt. I'm going to wear it. Man up. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff, Brandon. Let's do it again, brother. God bless you. Thank Appreciate you, Appreciate you, man. Thanks for your service. Uh, Law and Order. Uh, coming up next, spread the word. Cider Crusaders, welcome back to our special. I want to go to a civil rights lawyer because I want to talk about some some things that we can do to improve our police departments nationwide. And of course, we're going to do that with Leo Terrell. His Twitter handle is the Leo Terrell. Mr. Terrell, how are you, sir? Sir, my pleasure. I feel great. Glad to be here. Good. I'm glad you're here. So let's. We got a couple things to do here. So. N- number one reform that you think we should do in our police departments. What do you got? Number one reform, very simple. You need a special prosecutor to prosecute police officers. Why? Police officers work with the district attorney. They have a conflict of interest. They work together. They rely on each other. It is difficult for the district attorney to turn around and start prosecuting police officers. They have no experience. A special prosecutor would eliminate the conflict of interest. That, to me, is the most important reform. Let someone else prosecute police officers, bad police officers. Why? Because 97% of the officers are good. 3% are rotten to the core. Those 3% should be prosecuted. Is there any reason why maybe an independent prosecutor, I'm trying to think of devil's advocate, why they wouldn't have maybe the tools at their disposal or the ability to do this properly. I'm trying to think of why we don't, I'll bring it to you, why do we not already have independent uh, prosecutors? Well, well, there's politics involved and money involved and police unions involved and, and state lawmakers that won't pull the trigger on this reform. Look, there's no argument against that. There are trained lawyers, trained investigators to collect evidence and information. They would act just like a a district attorney, a prosecutor, funded by the state, well-financed, and I'll give you a national equivalence. Uh, On the national level, Robert Mueller was a special prosecutor outside the Department of Justice. So it can be done. You just want competent people. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay, I like that. Has it been done? Do we we have any case studies of where that is happening with police departments? 
in the last couple of years, there are a few states like Wisconsin who have started to initiate a special prosecutor. But out of the 50 states, very few states have taken that initiative. And it has to be worked on. It has to be developed because, again, you got forces within the police unions and politicians who don't want this special prosecutor. It's long overdue. I got 25 years of experience, and I can tell you this is a needed reform. Yeah, okay, I like that one. Okay, you mentioned the unions. What's the union's role in all of this? Uh, very simple, money. They are, police unions are powerful. Like any public union, they funnel money into campaigns, into politicians. So they're not going to allow legislation such as a special prosecutor or other rules that protect them. For example, in Minnesota, that officer who murdered uh, George Floyd had 18 complaints. It's hard to fire a police officer. It's hard to discipline a police officer. Why? Because those collective bargaining agreements protect bad cops. Wow, that's, a, that's so amazing. So how could you, I don't want to say dismantle the union, that's a strong word, but how do you put the union back in its proper place where they're not protecting the 3%? We want them to protect the 97%, but not the 3%. Yes. I'll tell you right now, you've got to change the mindset. You know, that's why these lawmakers right now talking about reform, they're talking, it's that money from the police unions. They can't be beholden to the money. And I think it's very important when they come up with these collective bargaining agreements, the government, not the unions, dictate the disciplinary policies. And if you want to avoid what is happening in this country the last couple of weeks, the lawmakers have to say no to the union money and do what's right for the public. We cannot go through this again. Okay, I agree. Uh, number three, qualified immunity. Can you describe that for us? Sure. A horrible mistake created by judges. Qualified immunity is simply a two-step process. You have police officers who commit a use of excessive force, a constitutional violation, something where they use too much deadly force or excessive force, a chokehold. Then they're sued. However, there is an exception. If their conduct was reasonable, whatever that means. They're excused from liability. Who makes that decision? A judge, not a jury. And this whole issue of qualified immunity was to excuse or to get rid of frivolous lawsuits, but it's been used by police officers to protect themselves from liability. When they said things like, I was fearing for my life. I was afraid that this person might do something wrong. Therefore, I used this force. It's a excuse that is long overdue and wrong. It's You say it's judge created, so it's not in legislation? Absolutely. There is no legislation for qualified immunity. It's judge made law. It was to, wow. the principle was good. It was to get rid of frivolous lawsuits, stop citizens from suing polit uh, politicians, polit public figures, and police officers. It's been abused by cops. Why? Because at 3%, those who use deadly force, excessive force, they will come up with this with this perfectly crafted statement. I, I, I was fearing for my life. I was fearing for others. And guess what? A judge makes that decision as to whether or not qualified immunity applies. If the judge says yes, the lawsuit is over, even though there was Would a constitutional you... violation. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Would you be okay if we had qualified immunity, but a jury decided it? Let me think about that. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Okay. Take it out of the hands of a judge. I trust the jury system. Let the jury determine that. Let 12 members of the community make that determination. But don't put it in the hands of a single person, a judge. No, I, I, that, I will go along with that. Right now, as we speak, they're debating this issue in the Senate. Okay, so you... I wonder what they would exactly come up with. Uh, I hope they bring it to a jury, uh, like you're suggesting. Yes. What is what is a policy that you've been hearing out there to reform the police that you disagree with? Because here's three good ones. Uh, what's one that you're like, nah, 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 not no good? I'll tell you right now, the, the reforms that are being spoken about right now, I like what I'm hearing. 
I mean, there's nothing that I don't like because reform means something to improve the system and the system needs to be improved. What I have been hearing through the House of Representatives, local talk, and right now as we speak in the U.S. Senate, it's all good. The problem is what's going to come out from these arguments and compromise. So far, so good. What do you think of the, so defunding the police, what's your take on that? Oh, oh, please, please. That's not that's not a proposal by a politician or a lawmaker. <laughs> that's a proposal by some extremist groups from people who do not ever vote. Now, let me be clear. I'm a civil rights attorney. I believe in equality, but I am not a fool. Police officers protect us. Defunding the police is a ridiculous idea. I am 100% opposed to it. At 2 and 3 in the morning, even those extremist groups, they will call the police to protect them. So defunding the police is not on my agenda. That's not even a reform. That is a destruction of the police department. You know, L.A., right? L.A., they got L.A. to take $150 million out. And the argument is, well, it's like a huge percentage of the budget. And it's actually not that big of a percentage of the budget. It's like 30%. Some people say it's like way high above and half, but it's not. It's like 30% of the LA's budget, et cetera, and most of these cities. Do you say that's too much or is that appropriate? I say that's inappropriate. You know what the thing that's so ironic about these lawmakers? These lawmakers are not friends with these extremists, but they call for this $150 million reduction in LA City. Guess what? The city council president for the last two months was getting round the clock protection. Guess from whom? The police. Yeah. And just she got exposed. Yeah. It's hypocritical. It's hypocrisy. Do not. So you're a civil rights attorney. What? Are, what are this idea of like instead of having police go to certain calls, you have uh, um, like uh, uh, social workers and, yes. and unarmed people uh, 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 going to certain types of calls. Is there anything r- reality there or no? Uh, to go for a social worker or a mental health specialist to go along with the police. Yes. By themselves, no. That is a, 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 a prescription for greater liability, greater exposure for harm, and a thank you letter from criminals who would like to have a individual go without police powers, without the powers to arrest. I agree with, with the idea of them coming along with the police, but to take the police officer out of the equation, a horrible idea. I want to be very I like honest that nuance. with people on this. Yeah. I like that nuance. That's great. Okay, uh, I got a question about um, the Minneapolis case. I've been reading a couple articles lately saying that there's a chance that this guy walks on the murder charge. Maybe a manslaughter, definitely a manslaughter, they're saying. But maybe walks on the murder. What do you think the chances are of that? Oh, whatever you heard, that's a good That's a good argument. I personally believe wow. second-degree murder is an overcharge. Let me repeat that. Second-degree murder is an overcharge. And the other officers, conspiracy on a second degree, aiding and abetting on a second degree, overcharge. That is, wow. it's going to be hard. Officers do not wake up in the morning with the intent to kill. Now, that officer committed a murder. Voluntary manslaughter, yes. But a intent, a second degree murder charge is way is too excessive. Wow. Uh, the district attorney, excuse me, the attorney general is playing politics, and if they don't get a conviction, excuse my language, all hell's going to break loose. Uh, I was just going to say, Mr. Trout, can you even imagine? Because no one, most people aren't going to understand the nuance of the second degree charge, et cetera, right? The people are just going to freak out. How, so what are you going to tell people? Well, that's why the the state attorney general, Keith Ellison, who's playing politics with this, also has a a manslaughter charge in the uh, complaint. So second degree murder, they may lose on that, but they have a a lesser included charge where they'll get a conviction. I'm more comfortable with the lesser included charge of manslaughter recklessness, that's what it's called, versus the second degree. That's too high for me. How long do you go to jail for a manslaughter? In Minnesota, you got a 25-year jail sentence for the second-degree okay. murder. It's 40 years. So, hey, look, if that guy gets put away for 25 years, justice has been served. My point okay, is, that's still a long time. Okay. overcharge. Yeah. What do you think about uh, continuing the use of chokeholds for police departments? Well, I thought the president yesterday, with his executive order, was right on point. Eliminate the chokehold, except 
if a police officer was in danger of losing his life. So if there is a battle, a struggle, and the only way the officer can survive in a one-on-one -on -one battle, to, I have no problem with the chokehold. But for any other tactical measure, I think it's totally inappropriate and should be eliminated. I think the argument that the defense lawyers are going to make is that it was in the Minneapolis police protocol. They thought this guy was on some drug, some something that makes him, you know, superhuman strong, and they were doing the protocol to keep him from causing harm. That's the defense lawyer argument, right? Oh, and that, and let me tell you right now, that's going to be a great argument. Look, if I'm the defense attorney for those three, for those Ford Road officers. All I keep saying is I'm following policy. I'm following policy. Yeah. I'm following policy. You know why that's important? Because it negates the intent to commit murder. I'm following police yeah. practice. I I have was trained this way. And let's not forget the some two of the officers, if I if I'm correct, was only on the job for four days. So they totally inexperienced, wow. and they're going to rely on the fact that they're going to say I was relying on my supervisor. Again, wow. negating intent. Oof, man. Okay, um, Mr. Terrell, I'm, su I'm super grateful for you. I'm grateful that we're going to see you out there on the Kamala Harris campaign trail when she's vice president. Um, you got to be kidding. You got to be kidding. <laughs> I, will, I, just, I will campaign day and night, 24-7, against Kamala Harris. Why? <laughs> I go right to that. She incarcerated more African Americans as the attorney general than any other AG. She is horrible. She has no moral compass. She is strictly a political wannabe and if joe biden selects her as his vp i want everyone in everyone in this country to know leo terrell will be campaigning against that ticket <laughs> but she's black Mr. i terrell. don't care if she's black. I mean, i'm glad you said that let me be clear uh she doesn't get a pass because of skin color there is no one black person who speaks for all african americans or black americans and let me be clear black politicians who have made a living, especially some Democratic black politicians, have made a living basically compromising their principles in order to stay in office. A few of them, Kamala Harris is one of them. Yeah. Mr. Terrell, the Leo Terrell, T-E-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Uh, you're a good man, sir. Grateful for your time. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. More coming Please up feel free on to our call special. Me again. Mike Slater. Mike. Spread the word. Hey, Sider Crusaders, welcome back to our special Law & Order Police Under Attack. Okay, I want to uh, bring it back a little bit more here. We'll get a little more 30,000 feet perspective with one of our friends, Adam Carrington, professor at Hillsdale College. Adam, how are you, brother? I'm doing well. Hope you all are also. <laughs> Definitely. Like, I don't want to talk about this because we only got a few minutes, but could Hillsdale be any more important now than it's... Right? Like, like, the contrast between Hillsdale and just all the other ideologies and lack and philosophies that have been festering in our universities for decades now. It, it, it's never been more stark. So I'm super grateful for you and, and everyone at Hillsdale, and I hope my kids can go there one day. Um, oh, I want to throw it you. to you, Professor. I want to talk about law and order. Uh, that might be what the election ends up being about. I mean, who knows? We've still got a couple more months. But uh, what's the history of this in America that we need to be aware of? Where's the relevance? I think the underlying idea is to go all the way back to why our founders thought we had government in the first place, and that is mm. that human beings are imperfect, that they won't respect your rights, your safety, your property, uh, at least not everyone will without some constraint, and that therefore the very reason government is instituted is because men aren't angels, and therefore when government succeeds at that basic idea, we can talk about other goals of government that might be also appropriate. When they don't do it, then you basically have anarchy. And um, and people are not very uh, uh, permitting of that. And so the history of America, I think there have been numerous times, um, uh, I think we'll talk about 1968 in particular being one example, where the breakdown of that first maybe fundamental goal of government, uh, people don't like it. People don't uh, vote for it, and therefore I think it is something that as we're seeing these riots play out, we are going to have to ask what will the public response be in relation to how this fundamental idea of government is supposed to be uh, carried out. 
Love it. I want to get to 68 in a second, but another one last big picture. Um, why do, why are people not all about law and order? <laughs> you know, how do I word this properly? Like, like wh where's the appeal in the more utopian vision of abolish the police or, that, that's even more extreme, but, but the idea that maybe we don't need police officers, where, where is this coming from and what's that based on? I'll give, uh, I think there's a less and more extreme version or ide ideology yes. behind that. Uh, one is, I think the, the, the more extreme one is that, hu that, that uh, human beings are not inherently flawed. Uh, society or social systems make them so. So if we just remake the social order, human beings will be all right, or at least uh, it, all right enough that you wouldn't need these things, which is, I, I think, uh, enough of the history of the world, I think, disproves that. Uh, I think yeah. the other is maybe a, a more extreme reaction to on the one hand, uh, men aren't angels, so we need government. Federalist 51 said this. At the same time, government uh, is not run by angels, it's run by men. And sometimes there's a reaction if there's a perceived tyrannical action by the government or if police are perceived to do something uh, that, that that violates someone's rights, and I know that was part of the issue that's, that, that's instigated the current episodes, then sometimes the idea is instead of restraining government, which everyone uh, should agree is, is, is necessary so that it only does its job, sometimes there's an idea that you need to do a more extreme uh, response that, that in some ways throws out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, so good. What uh, what do we need to know about 1968? What's the relevance to today? So 1968 was the last um, sort of widespread national set of riots where protest. We've had national protests b b before and since, but 1968 was the last time you had mass, especially urban riots, reacting to a number of factors, including the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And it became a very big issue in the fall election because, again, people didn't feel safe. Um, people that were even sympathetic to the civil rights movement were not sympathetic to some of the methods that were being used. Uh, you know, there's some interesting research out there that people are much more attuned and much more willing to be uh, uh, listened to peaceful protests as opposed to violent ones. And I think uh, it was a very close election in the fall of 68. Hubert Humphrey versus Nixon were the two main ones. Uh, and, and I think it really helped Nixon because he made law and order one of his main uh, uh, platforms. And I think it resonated with voters that might not otherwise have given than Nixon a look. Wow. Okay, so about the peaceful protests, we hear a lot from protesters that say, or rioters, that say, you don't listen to us unless it's violent and, and angry and, and uh, riotous. Uh, is that true? I think people will listen to violent rioters, but they might listen to them in the sense of, um, or react to them maybe is the better word, in the sense of, mm. uh, well, I don't want that, right? <laughs> and I, I think, so I, I think it might be inverse to what they actually say. Uh, and I think the underlying idea of that is the is, is pretty antithetical to how um, real political life is supposed to be. You know, Lincoln uh, said that, you know, uh, uh, you know, in trying to not have the Civil War, we need to have ballots decide our differences, not bullets. And if you say that bullets, or in this case, you know, that being a metaphor for violence, is the only way that we can settle or even discuss our differences, then basically you've declared that might makes right, not that might must be in the service of right. So I, the, the, the implications of that, I think, go way further than anyone who wants a stable and even just political order should be looking for. If you were a Trump political advisor, knowing about 68, uh, how would you advise him to perhaps proceed uh, rhetorically? I think that uh, what, what Nixon showed was uh, you, you need to emphasize the need for public safety. I think that uh, he would be good to emphasize that this is a public safety concern for all Americans, that many of the people being hurt are um, African-American and other minority business owners and others uh, who the rioters are, are saying they're wanting to help. Uh, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to acknowledge some of the, the, the the, the pain and doubt and worries about racial tensions in the country, but to say that uh, law and order has to be the starting point. It can't be something that can be mm. questioned.
The other thing, though, I would advise if I were advising, and I'm I, I'm not, just to be clear, um, <laughs> is is one advantage Nixon though did have was that he was running against a Democratic. Uh, not incumbent, but Democrats had held the White House since 1961. Mm. Um, he is the incumbent, so he is going to have to make the argument that law and order is something that he has done enough of and that he needs four more years to put in even more because he can't, as Nixon did, run against the Democratic Party yeah. being in charge as 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 saying, they've failed, try me. He's going to have to yeah, say, uh, try me. The states or failed. Or, or, yeah, or like uh, <clears throat> the Democrat-run states have failed or the Democratic-run cities yeah. have failed. I wouldn't yeah, even, that, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, That's a little more nuanced, <clears throat> Gark. <clears throat> Professor, to, to wrap up our show and our week here, it's so easy uh, for me and everyone to get all amped up Right, and, and the media is just pumping us with this is the most important thing that's ever happened in the whole world, and then we just move on to the next thing the next week. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being Civil War, right, which, which we had. I think people forget that that was only 155 years ago. That's not that long ago. So 10 being a Civil War, I would argue that we're at like a 2 or 3 on like the freak out severity scale, even though it feels like we're at a max 10. Uh, with your historical perspective and wisdom, where would you say we're on that? rudimentary scale uh, yeah i i would put it under a five and 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 i know that that's not going to get a lot of clicks if i wrote an article for that as exactly. you said with the media but uh i i i think some uh, yes we have intense partisan divisions yes we've had violence but by the way we had nothing like the violence that happened in the 60s many more terrorist acts were done domestically uh, the crime rate was much higher if you go all the way back to the 1790s and the election of 1800 uh the federalist and the democratic republicans adams versus jefferson thought that literally whether we were going to be a monarchy or a republic was at stake i think it was overblown that debate we fought a civil war where six to seven hundred thousand men died that you referenced uh, when an election didn't go the way that everyone wanted and the underlying issues with that. So I, I don't want to downplay that these are, this is an important election, that we have to be involved, we have to ask really fundamental questions that we're going to be needing to debate. I don't want to, though, make it as if uh, tempt people to turn to violence if this election doesn't go their way. Let's keep the democratic process. Let's protect it because I think it's 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 almost a miracle that we've been able to solve so many of our differences through the ballot box, not with war. Uh, unbelievably unprecedented in the history of the world. Let's try to keep that if at all possible. Uh, so much more to talk about, and I'm so glad you can help guide us there. Adam Carrington from Hillsdale College. Uh, gosh, you guys. You guys are must continue to be a beacon. And I, I really think the whole college industrial complex will collapse. I hope it does, uh, but you guys will will remain. Um, Adam, appreciate you, man. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Law and order, police under attack. Slider Crusaders, have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Spread the word.